Welcome to CSI Coatesville. This is the third in a two-part series on the justice system. And today, science goes to court. In this program, we're going to take a look at the rules for evidence, the scientific method, particularly as it pertains to forensic science, something known as the low-card exchange principle, the Fry standard, and another important ruling called Daubert ruling. First, the rules of evidence. Keep in mind, in order to prove something in court, there are several things that need to be established in order to establish guilt in the courtroom. First, the motive why a person would commit a crime. Now, we use the word love here kind of tongue in cheek. Really, love is, is only going to do good to another person, but people may feel a sense of love for one person, and out of a sense of love for that person, they might be tempted to do something bad to somebody else. Probably the most common motive that's used for a crime is because people want money. That's right, greed. And then ideology. This may be hard to understand, but certain people's religious or political ideas may lead them to commit a crime against someone else. And then also that old idea of revenge. That's right. You did me wrong, so I'm going to get you back. That's also a motive for a crime. And yet there are other reasons why people commit crimes. But if these can be established in a court, that's a motive that's important. Next, the means. In other words, does a person have the ability to actually commit the crime? And then finally, can they be placed at the crime scene? In other words, did they have the opportunity to commit the crime? And yet there is more regarding rules of evidence. In order for evidence to be useful in a court, it has to be two things. First, it has to be material. In other words, it has to be related to the matters of the crime in some important way. You've probably heard of a material witness to a crime. In other words, they actually saw the crime being committed. But that's not all. Not only does it have to be material, but that evidence also has to be probative. In other words, it actually has to prove something. And here's where forensic science can be most useful. Now, the evidence triangle. Much of what we do in forensic science is to make a connection in this triangle between the victim, the suspect, and the crime scene. In other words, can we place the suspect at a crime scene? Can we also place the victim at the crime scene with the physical evidence that's there? So much of our time is spent establishing this triangle. Now, it's also true to say that there are certain types of crimes that are victimless. In other words, there is no identifiable victim to a particular crime. I bet you can think of some examples of those. Now, as we move on, the scientific method is particularly useful here. In the scientific method, we state a problem or ask a question about the physical world. We also state a hypothesis. In other words, we're thinking of what we think the answer to our question is going to be or the solution to the problem. And we state it in such a way that's actually testable using physical evidence. And so we're going to go ahead and test that hypothesis with an experiment. We're going to gather data and then against that data we're going to reflect upon results. In other words, do the results that we gather, do they actually support the hypothesis in answering the question or problem that we've had? And of course, that's what we do when we, in the conclusion, we're going to evaluate that. Now, as you take a look at the steps that you see on the screen, on the screen do you see where the crime would fit in? Right here, that's the problem. A crime's been committed, so who did it? All right. Who committed that crime? And so this is where the investigative process begins. Now, once we've looked at MMO, in other words, the means, the motive, and the opportunity, the district attorney or the investigating officers, the detectives involved, they may come up with a suspect that they believe had the means, the motive, and the opportunity. Now, 
what we need to do is we need to gather the evidence. We need to gather the evidence in order to establish the fact, again, going back to that evidence triangle, that this suspect not only had the motive, not only had the means, but also can be placed at the scene of the crime. And this is where forensic science is going to be helpful. Okay, and so we're going to begin to gather evidence here, these observations by way of forensic science, in order to determine whether or not this suspect can be ruled out. Okay, now if they can rule out that suspect, then we need to move on. If the evidence excludes that person, that suspect, for some reason, then we need to move on to another suspect. And of course, this is where reflection is going to come into play here. We're going to reflect upon the evidence to see whether or not we can rule out that, um, that suspect. And then evaluating, okay? And then beyond that, we'll get into this later, the detectives and the district attorney, they have to actually have to develop a, a theory of the crime. Now take a look at this photograph that I have in here. Here we have a bottle of what looks like to be Jack Daniels whiskey. And yet someone drank from this one day and what was not in that bottle was whiskey, but was in fact sulfuric acid. Was a crime committed? Go back to MMO. If we can establish a motive, why a person would exchange the, the beverage that was in here for sulfuric acid. Were they trying to do harm to somebody? That has to be demonstrated. Make sense? Did they have the means? In other words, did they have the ability to acquire some sulfuric acid? And can they actually be placed at the scene where this bottle was? In other words, can we find their fingerprints or their DNA, for example, on that bottle? That's where the MMO and the evidence all comes together to draw that triangle of evidence together. So the investigative process in solving a crime has a lot to do with the scientific method. You can see that. And then we move on. There is another very important principle that we use in forensic science known as the Locard Exchange Principle. And this is really at the very foundation of all forensic science. So I'd like you to take notes on this. Edmund Locard was a French scientist as well as investigator who lived in the 19th and 20th century. And he was the first person to develop uh, and bring about the world's first forensic laboratory, also known as the father of, father of criminalistics. So he get, this goes back quite a ways. Now, in his writings, he established this one very, very important principle known as the Locard Exchange Principle. And what does that say? That whenever two objects come into contact with each other, there is always a transfer of material. Now, you'll notice that we use the word principle here, not law. Now, if we were to say law, that means that it occurs all the time, and that's not true. But in the investigative process for solving crimes, we make the assumption that there is an exchange between the two objects that come into contact. So, in the investigative process, when a crime scene is being processed, we make that assumption that there has been an exchange between the victim and the crime scene, between the victim and the suspect, and between the suspect and the crime scene. Just like we saw back when we were looking at the, the evidence triangle, okay? So these arrows here represent that exchange that Edmund Lockhart wrote about, okay? So these arrows here represent that exchange of material. It could be fibers from clothing. It could be cells from a person's body. And of course, that carries DNA. It could be fingerprints. It could be pieces of paper. It could be virtually anything. But we make that assumption that this exchange has taken place in the process of that crime being committed. Where does this all go in terms of the courtroom? Well, 
at some point a decision has to be made as to what kinds of evidence really is scientific and rightfully belongs in a, a courtroom in order to establish matters of fact. And back in 1923, there was a very important ruling. There was a man that was accused of murder. In fact, he was convicted of committing murder. And yet, uh, evidence, part of the evidence that was used to convict him was a bogus method of lie detection that actually predated the, the, the method that's now used today. When this went to the Supreme Court, that decision, that murder conviction was overturned because it was determined that this particular method of lie detection was not widely accepted in scientific circles. And so that became what we call, now call the Fry Standard. In other words, scientific evidence must be accepted by a relevant scientific community for it to be admissible in court. And of course, because the Supreme Court ruled this, that quickly became the law of the land. Now, this goes all the way back to 1923. Under the Fry Standard, it's actually the jury that hears the evidence that's presented in the courtroom and they are the ones that make the decision whether or not that evidence can be used in proceeding with the trial, in finding matters of fact. However, the Fry Standard offers no guidance regarding the reliability of that evidence. In other words, is it going to consistently produce the same results day in and day out? Now, let's move forward in time. Another very important case was tried in 1993. A family by the name of Daubert had two children that were had severe birth defects and it was believed that the Dow Chemical Company who had uh, produced a prescription medication was the cause of the birth defects that these two children experienced. And the court had ruled at that time that the, uh, the Fry standard was really insufficient in determining matters of fact in this case. And so they'd set forward a set of standards that would provide for tests of reliability uh, in the courtroom. They also made a very important change. No longer were laymen, in other words, the jury, going to be put with the responsibility of determining what kinds of evidence would be used to determine matters of fact in the courtroom. Now it's ultimately the judge's responsibility to determine what evidence can be used. But not only that, the judge was given a set of guidelines that he could follow that I want to go over in a minute. Keep in mind that the Daubert ruling is authoritative in federal courts, and the state courts are expected to use that as a guide for their decisions as well. The Fry standard that predates this, as I mentioned a moment ago, that is authoritative in, in all courts, including the states. Now, what are the guidelines that judges are to apply in introducing new scientific evidence in the courtroom? Let's go through those. First, the theory or technique must be testable. In other words, via experiment, and that that experiment, those results can be repeated over and over again. It's also got to be subject to peer review and publication in a relevant scientific community. Also, the rate of error is known and it's at an acceptable limit. And the methods that that uh, technique uses are well-established laboratory standards and that this technology or method, whatever it is, is widely accepted in the relevant scientific community. So now the judge is going to apply these tests that you see on the screen here on that evidence. And he's now given, he or she are now given a guide uh, in order to determine whether or not particular types of scientific evidence that has not been used before can be used in a court of law. All right, now here's some questions to consider. What other motives might someone have in committing a crime other than the ones that we've mentioned in this program already? I also would like you to imagine this. Let's say that a researcher claims to have developed a test to identify someone who is murdered in the past by enzymes that are found in their saliva. Enzymes are proteins that could be easily identified. Should that be admitted into court? Now I'd like you to think that through and explain why or why not or how that would take place. 
And finally and lastly, can evidence be material but not probative? Think about that. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.